You don't want to sit between us? Not that I'm aware of. Hello, public. Would anybody like to stand up and say hello or make any public comment before we get on with our presentation? Sherry? So I was sent a letter from Meg Seeley that she wanted read, read to the board. Could you just introduce yourself? I'm Sherry Souza, Director of Instructional Support Services for Windsor Center. Can you explain who the person is that you're So Meg Seeley is a community member from Bridgewater. She also was involved in the strategic plan. Okay. So she says, I'm a resident of Bridgewater, the mother of three children raised in the Woodstock schools, and a retired educator. I've recently had the opportunity to work with Mary Beth and other school and community leaders who looked at a portrait of a graduate, including developing vision about what an ideal curriculum would include. About a decade ago, I served on the Governance Committee, a two-year-long professionally facilitated deep dive into how to maximize the supervisory union schools, including studying the reconfiguring of student bodies, which brings me to the present. Last week, I had the opportunity to attend the architect's presentation of the summary findings regarding renovating versus new, versus new build of the Woodstock Union Middle School and High School. I am a strong proponent of the new building approach. It just makes so much more logical sense than any of the other plans. I left hopeful for our future for the first time in a long time, and I hope to join you at this evening's meeting to tell you so in person, but was unable to do so. As we all know, schools are economic drivers for our rural Vermont commodity communities. The inspirational, com the inspirational coming together of a portrait of a graduate curriculum delivered by an, our extraordinary staff in a new building that would meet the needs of for every child and would support new families moving to our area the way young families are flocking to neighboring Norwich, Vermont, for its well-known quality public schools. Is a new school expensive and a huge undertaking for a region of our size? Of course it is, but other projects are in process around New England towns, very similar to ours. It is my strong position that we must join those others who are undertaking major investments in their schools so as to return our public school reputation to one of vibrancy that my children enjoyed when they were growing up here 30 years ago. Can you please submit that to Raina so that we can have that officially in the notes? <coughs> Thank you. Um, okay, Bob, I'm gonna hand it over to Bob, um, who has been associated to this project since the beginning. And he's gonna talk <laughs> us through, along with Lee Sherwood, who is gonna give the presentation on the architectural plan. Um, and I want you all to just, listen and learn and keep an open mind to the things that are going to be presented tonight. Um, no decisions are going to be made this evening. This is going to be a continued conversation uh, through the next month as well as at our retreat. Um, and we will be voting on several of these topics in our June 10th meeting. So just really try to establish your knowledge of what's happened over the last three years um, and, and the incredible work that has been done up until this point. Go for it, Bob. Bob Coates, I'm a uh, board member from Pomfret and my colleague uh, Bryce Hamill from Barnard and I uh, currently chair a committee called the um, Configuration and We Tacked On Enrollment Growth. Uh, as part of the name of that committee. So we've been meeting regularly since uh, January and have gotten to the point where we have forwarded to the board and what's in your packet are uh, two unanimous recommendations from that committee for discussion tonight along with the presentation from Lee. Uh, we've taken up uh, at uh, June 3rd and then uh, at, at the retreat we've got a few opportunities before uh, a vote on the 10th. Um, the first of those is um, a resolution. The board votes to endorse the Campus Configuration Committee's recommendation to pursue evaluating the financial feasibility of a district-wide facility improvement plan for the following reasons. It's out there outlined. So what we're looking for is an opportunity. It's been a long road to get here. If you'll remember before the Act 46 board, the old SU board, um, over two years ago um, with private donation of funds to help us employ an architect, we started this, we started this process. 
And there was an initial committee which um, I chaired, which was the 21st Century uh, School Committee, which began to look at this process and recommendations around, specifically around middle school and high school uh, building and campus, master plan. We've, in addition to that, part of this resolution, this first resolution, will be incorporating research that um, Joe Pagoli's been doing on the elementary school campuses. So we know there are some capital needs and investments that need to be made in each of our elementary schools. Those will be incorporated into um, the, uh, the concept recommendation that you'll vote on on the 10th. So why are we here? Um, I can remember a long time ago, about the time that my uh, eldest was a senior, eldest child was a senior, um, came into seventh grade, I had sort of the first time, first impression of walking through the uh, middle high school. And um, I was thrilled for her to be here. I knew the reputation of this, of this school, the faculty and staff, but I was discouraged. I was discouraged by the state of the building, the age of the building, and um, wanted to help look into an effort to say, you know, you know, we should really think about upgrading upgrading this facility. There's a facilities report that was completed, and for me, this captures sort of that feeling that I had then um, in terms of the, the life and history of this, of this facility. Nearly 60-year-old facility is maintain, maintained by an active and thoughtful facilities department and committee. With limited resource, financial resources, they have kept the school up and running, well beyond the typical lifespan for, for such a facility. Many of the spaces serve their program better than they should or could be expected under these conditions. However, much of the building and the building systems are functionally obsolete, making it challenging to support 21st century learning and teaching. So there's, there's a lot there. And in the process of um, a lot of discovery and conversation and discussions, um, what I've learned is that we have a building at a moment in which we have to make some hard decisions about its future. Um, I think about, uh, I, mean, I mean, mentioned the committee, uh, um, Jason had sent me a picture of the old high school, which is where the elementary school sits now. And somewhere along the way, someone made a decision that facility wasn't going to, wasn't, wasn't going to do it for the future, for the future of the students then. I think we're at a similar inflection point now. I think what, we're, what we've got in front of us are changes in education and learning that are so substantial, have changed so substantially over uh, the last 60 years, and a facility that has just gone by its expiration date, that we've got to make some uh, really important des decisions about the future learning environment for our students here at the Middle High School. Uh, the master plan initiated in the spring of 2017, as you can see, was to really study the facility we hired Lee uh, and his um, uh, architectural firm. We did a lot of research. They were board members and faculty who traveled to uh, different locations across the U.S. I had an opportunity to go to the West Coast and take a look at schools within facilities or with, with facilities that were uh, much more meeting the demands of, of student learning. Uh, we looked at you know several alternative solutions created a series of recommendations. We've walked through a very involved process with the community. And we've involved a whole lot of people. So this, this ties in with um, lots of other processes that are going on as well. We've had community members representing all towns in the district, uh, faculty and staff, students and parents on various committees uh, involved in looking at options for us. The, the, the old SU board was involved, the unified board, and your opportunity tonight to hear uh, from the architect about where we are in this process. Um, the original 21st Century Committee, and then uh, the current Configuration Enrollment Committee, where all of this is sort of rolled up into uh, an opportunity for you all to hear where we are. So there's the physical deficiencies, and Lee will speak to these in some, some detail. Um, many of them, I think, are not necessarily uh, observable from the curb, but the, the various um, contractors that we've had come in here who did the facilities baseline study uh, have really looked at 
all kinds of mechanical issues that have just run run their course. This facility was you know, built in the 50s. Much of the uh, high, higher tech uh, building construction materials were, were obviously not available then. They are now, and you know there's there are some uh, general health and safety issues. Not all those you know those are really long term solutions by looking at uh, new, <coughs> new options. In this case, a new build option. Mary Beth is going to speak to how the process of looking at the construction of potentially a new school, the concept of building a new school, plays into uh, this new paradigm of learning and the strategic, the strategic plan and the portrait of a graduate. <coughs> Great. Um, so we've talked a lot, particularly over the past couple of meetings that we've been together around the, the concept of the fact that what our graduate school is changing. Um, given the realities of what's happening in the world. We've looked at student A and student B. Um, we've talked about the new skill sets. We've talked about those non-routine tasks. We've talked about the service economy. And so what we know in trying to create a school district that's going to be responsive to those new sets of demands on our students, we've had to look at a number of different elements that are associated with teaching and learning. So in that, we, we have done work around a portrait of a graduate. Here are the outcomes that we have decided are important for our kids to possess when they graduate. And then we went to say, OK, if these are our outcomes, how do we get there? And so that's the strategic plan that we started to unpack last week. Um, and, and one of the items that we did not unpack last week was um, the, the category of learning environments. We had talked about student success, we had talked about community alliance, we had talked about um, culture, and we had talked about foundational systems, but we had not yet brought in this learning environment piece. And all of these pieces are parts of a puzzle that it, we believe that when we snap them all together, we're, we're gonna have something pretty amazing. Uh, so when we talk about teaching and learning, we, this group, and I've, I've certainly been part of some of these conversations, part of the process has been what do learning environments look like for kids? When they're, they're learning um, in the ways that we know will, will meet the criteria for the portrait of the graduate. And those environments look differently than they looked 50 years ago. And there are some pretty substantial differences around them. So this, this presentation that you're going to see this evening and this idea of learning environments, while we certainly look at facilities and has it outlived its lifespan, I would argue that the more compelling reason are what are the kinds of environments our kids need to be in in order to accomplish the goals of the portrait of the graduate. Um, so I just wanted to kind of connect those lines in terms of where, where we've been heading and how all the pieces fit together. This, for me, this project is tied into lots of other conversations we're having in, in the communities in our um, school district. Um, I mean, good schools do help build, uh, build communities. I think part of, part of our issue is we need to be able to attract folks to this area and, uh, and keep our elementary school population strong. But we have great faculty, great staff, I think what we lack is some curb appeal, um, and I think that has a significant plays a significant role in some of the economic development conversations we're having. Um, it, it, it makes a difference. Future ready school. Um, we, we're building the curriculum. We just need to build the facility to match um, all the good work that we're doing on the, on the curriculum and education side, on the learning side. Let me introduce um, Lee Sherwood. Um, who has been working with us for over two years, um, very patiently, and uh, let him uh, give you the details of this uh, proposal. I, I want to emphasize that what we're looking for, uh, or what the committee is looking for is, <coughs> on the 10th, is an endorsement of the concept. There's a lot of work that will need to be done beyond what you're going to see tonight. Uh, the financial uh, viability of what we've what we're proposing is untested, and the committee that 
uh, Bryce and I are, are chairing would, would uh, begin the next phase if, uh, of looking at the, finance, the financing possibilities. But we really need a decision um, from the full board in, in, order, in order to be able to do that. What we're talking about is concept. Um, thanks. Yeah. I, would you guys be able to just move that uh, angle just a bit? It's, it's very difficult. Uh, and turn at it. the same time, you're moving it that way, pull it back more so you'll bring it Can you pull it forward now? Down. That's okay. Well, Thank you. Just, Thanks for your patience. How's that? And I wanted to get this over here so I, I could press. There's a lot of slides, and I need to be able to press the button. So I don't know if I don't know if there's any really good place for me to stand. So I'll just stand here. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Lee Sherwood. I'm from Lavalli Brunson Architects. And we have been working on this project for a couple of years now. Um, how many people in this room have seen this kind of large, you know, final presentation before? A few people, okay. Um, there's a lot of new people here, new faces, so I think it's important to go through it, but I'm going to try, especially in the facilities portion, to go through it without a, a ton of commentary because Otherwise, it'll be very painful for you, all of you. <laughs> so, um, when we were first uh, hired to look at this project, it was surprising and, um, and revealing that the group that hired us had goals that were not just, we need to look at a school. Goals like, you know, creating an inspiring 21st century, which we'll talk about environment. Um, celebrating authentic Vermont values. There's something about this place, this area, where you live, that's different than anywhere else. And wherever you build a school, you want it to kind of imbibe those, those feelings about how, what, you, what you, is important to you. Um, how do you maximize school and community use? In, uh, is it okay if I refer to you as rural? Because you're not really, but you are, you know. So uh, in communities such as this, where you're serving many towns, a school is a community building. And you're gonna use it for so many things. Here you are right now in the school, you just happen to be in the nicest room in the whole school, which is nice, but if we were in one of the classrooms, you may not feel as good. Um, and then nothing, is more timely and important <coughs> nowadays than safety, uh, security, and really accessibility. Accessibility means that everybody can use a school equally. It's not just wheelchair, but it's also you know, visual or hearing or any other issues at all. And safety, and safety is a huge, you all know, uh, is a huge uh, issue in schools design today. Um, how do you communicate the school identity and pride? Um, and then uh, many of you believe in sustainability and um, there's different, a, a way of living green or, or being um, sustainable in that way. And with buildings nowadays in architecture and in sites, there's a whole new way of looking at a building that is and in, probably in this case, how do we build a building that is the most energy efficient as possible for your, you know, for what your um, uh, values are? And then lastly, it's always important to build something that's flexible, cost effective, efficient. In the, in the slide before this, you saw the word future ready, which might be kind of a buzzword. But that, what that really means is that today, you know what you want to do to teach. But in 20 years, since 20 years ago it was different, what is it going to be like? So we better build this build this new building so that it can be adapted, so it's a flexible. 
not just flexible, things can move, but walls that could be torn down and rebuilt in. One of the problems you're gonna see is that we have a building that's made of cement and concrete block. We can, it's, it's almost impossible financially to change it. Well, if we were smart, we wouldn't build it that way again. So that the poor architect who has to stand up here in 80 years, let's give it 80 years, <laughs> um, can say, oh, well, this is easy. They left, we can modify this. So any good master plan starts with a with a with a work, you know, kind of a work plan, and these are the phases that we undertook. Afterwards, it actually shows where it happened. Say fall, winter, two thousand seventeen. This was not done in a couple of months. This was done over, say, the course of a year and a half. And there were some times where we kind of stopped for a little while and let things settle, which is smart. It's wise. First thing we did was have a good schedule. Second thing we did was we looked at the facilities. We brought in all of our engineers. Third thing we did was have case studies where we looked at different, especially all the fa some faculty over here. People went to the West Coast and the East Coast and all around, and they looked at schools that had just been built and they had ideas about what to do. And then we had a consultant come in who's an expert in educational design, David Steven, and had workshops to vision and to talk about it. Then we looked at program, and program is really the spaces. How big is this library? How many books does it hold? How many people sit here? All those kinds of things. And uh, then we looked at design concepts. Notice how we didn't draw what the school should look up, look like, or how big it should be until we did all this information gathering. That's really the way you should do things. <coughs> and, um, we looked at concepts and we went back and looked at it some more, and then we came up with a final recommendation. I have to say that I myself never recommended anything. All I did was show you, I think I didn't, I mean, I might have had biases, obviously, but oh, what would be easier, what would be uh, more value. But the truth is that it's really contingent upon you to have a uh, collective belief in all of this. So the first phase, which was about the schedule, the only reason I'm talking about this in, in the beginning is because we started to work on this, and then all of a sudden, you had a new superintendent, you had new like ideas about unifying things, you talked about the strategic plan, and after discussing it, we, we determined that the master plan should be really integrated with all the other educational initiatives, strategic plans, portrait of the, of the graduates, um, as well as you being sitting here because this is a process as well. So we actually put the brakes on it and let a lot of things happen before we went in because we're just a component of all this. We want to be smart about this. We want to show you a, a project or, or an idea and then say, well, that doesn't fit what we want to do. And then phase two was the facilities assessment. And again, that's where we brought in all of our consultants, mechanical, structural, civil, which is actually the civil engineer <coughs> down the street and has worked on this site before, worked on the, um, the arena. Landscape, uh, all the different aspects. We had code people come in and look at all the code issues. A building of, of this, of this vintage, that was nice, um, has all kinds of code issues because a lot of the codes didn't exist then and now they do. Uh, so we had everybody come in. Uh, just so you know, you are in the library edition which was in, done in 1994, which makes it pretty modern. And that's why it feels so new, clean, nice. Um, by the way, look at, see that strip of windows up there and that little ledge? The sun comes in, that's south. It comes in, it comes in, bounces off the ceiling and into the room. That is good daylighting strategy. So it doesn't just come in and, and, and hit you all during the day. It saves electricity. So you have the high school, which is really one story. And then the middle school, <coughs> which is kind of the, I'm gonna say the problem child, not because it's the middle school, but because of the way it's, because of the way it's built. 
although my daughter's in middle school and well. <laughs> so um, the existing site, this was a sketch that we did really early on. And just keep in mind, you know, you're in a valley and there's the river right there. And you don't have a, a huge connection to the river, but it's a Vermont kind of river, you know, with the rocky, so it's not really this big wide open thing. Um, but that's where the sun is. And you see, this is the solar, the way the sun moves around. And this is really important, the solar arc. If I say one thing about the sun is that when you're up here in the middle of the winter, the sun in the winter, the, these, these two guys here, it comes up um, really, the arc, of, the arc and the angle comes up really late and it comes down really early. And so you have an angle that only faces almost south. You know what I mean? And if you want to get daylight and collect energy from that, you really want to be facing as south as possible. As the year goes along, the sun comes up further away, you know, and, and a larger angle goes around. So up here in Vermont, where it's really cold, and uh, you have a lot of energy bills, and you have a lot of electric bills, this is really important stuff. It's a beautiful site, it's just not necessarily laid out very well. When I go through this facility stuff, I'm going to go through relatively quickly, um, or I'm going to try to, because it's been looked at many times before. The site issues have a lot to do with not using the site very well, and um, a lot of it has to do with the car and bus drop-offs not being very safe, and how the parking, you walk through those lots and all of that to get him. And, and it turns out, we saw, we, I, I saw a safety presentation, and most um, accidents that happen with kids, it's not school shootings, it's not even falling down the stairs, they're almost um, the, the largest um, contributor is traffic accidents. Uh, I don't know, getting hit by a bus, but you know, cars and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Then um, you have a lot of um, issues with water. You have a river and you have a lot of low land and when you have a hurricane, <coughs> sometimes it floods. When you look at the existing building, the thing to, I, I'd like to share about this is that this is kind of a 1960s school layout. It is a quarters with school, with you know classrooms. I think they call it cells and bells or something like that. There's the idea that the corridor just brings you to all these classrooms and the classroom happens, that's where you go and you, you get injected with memory. Do you know what I mean? You memorize stuff and there's a, there's a sage at the front. You guys are all different now. And that person gives you information and you suck it in and you go to college, right? And it's a little different now. It's much more collaborative. And you can imagine, as uh, Mary Beth was alluding to, that the spaces might be very different when you want to collaborate. Look at this room right here, how it's being used. During the day, it's used very differently. And now you can use it like this. And if I wanted to set it up differently, I can. It's just really important. And having those kinds of spaces and those, those kind of rigid spaces with that spine of the middle, that's really difficult to get people to work together. Um, <coughs> there's so many, so many examples in, in the building of spaces being used for things that they weren't intended to be used <coughs> for, uh, like the auditorium lobby, which I don't think anybody really uses to come in and out of the building so much, is a, is a choral room. The music room down. You've all been through the building or through the school. Walk through the school sometime, especially like again, <coughs> this is the nicest. This is a really nice room. Down into some of the other areas. The band room in particular is very low, um, uh, cacophonous with sound when the band is playing. Does not have good acoustics throughout the rest of the its adjoining spaces. <coughs> and the basketball at middle school basketball court is right on top of it, so you hear boom, 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 boom all day. Uh, from the basketball. So you can imagine that uh, just acoustics is a huge issue throughout the school. Uh, and you've been to the cafeteria, and again, the cafeteria is very inflexible. It has columns, which means you can't use it for a lot <coughs> of things. And also, it kind of feels like a basement. So in terms of security, it's really important 
that we understand the boundaries of a site for those who haven't thought about this and then vehicular like how close vehicles can get to a building because that's one way that people enter a building when they're not supposed to or they hurt you know in, with intentions um, the entry should not only be visible which your entry well if you've never been to the school you may not have found the entry yet but the entry is hard to find and it's supposed to have a vestibule both for for climate but also for protection then you get buzzed in somebody sees you you come in and sign in you get a badge you get the next button like there's a whole sequence of events and even when you go into a building the smart thing de these days it's not about technology necessarily it's about compartmentalizing the whole school so maybe a person can get this far but what if they get a little further and they get into the lobby and that be closed down and how do I protect the the academic wings and close those down for lockdown and for escape or whatever it is. A, a school should be designed functionally to protect the children and, and teachers in, uh, in that kind of event. This school is not necessarily designed that way, but I don't think they were thinking about it at all. <coughs> Building envelope means that you have a structure, you have a building, but all the exterior walls, which keep the water and the heat in, the water out, the heat in, the cool in, whatever it is, are really important. And when you have an older building, you have a lot of joints that are opening up, you have a lot of sills where water's been getting in, and when you see this kind of damage um, you know, under a sill, that means that water's getting under there and it's damaging everything behind it. Um, also, you have those, all those infill stucco panels Somebody decided at one point that that was going to save a lot of money and energy. There's probably better ways to do it now, but back then that might have been the way to do it. But I don't know what's behind those panels, but I don't want to know. Um, a lot of the brick walls, these brick walls do not have weep holes where the water can come and get out. And so it was just built a certain way at a certain time. And what it means is that no matter what we do to the exterior, we're probably not going to be able to substantially um, increase its ability to hold heat. In other words, the insulation, it's not well insulated. To keep water out, because it already is what it is, and to make it very efficient. Your electrical bills up here could get pretty, probably get high after a while. Um, there are structural concerns. I don't think that's the biggest problem that you have here. The structure, I mean, it's fairly solid, but the biggest problem is that the whole middle school, which is the two-story wing here, which here, but also that whole wing out there, is made out of these con heavy concrete planks and, um, and concrete block. And it, it's almost impossible to modify it, but also, like I said about codes, there are, there are seismic codes now for earthquakes and stuff. It doesn't need it at all. I guess it's kind of like a deck of cards if there was an earthquake. I'm not saying it's going to fall down, but it doesn't meet the current codes. And the structural engineer says he couldn't come up with a way to make it meet the codes. So it's just a, uh, it's just built in a certain way that makes room for problems. But probably the most um, jarring part of the existing school are the HVAC systems, or lack of. When you walk through the school, there's no there's no um, real ventilation air. So you could open your windows and let some air in, but you know, most of the time it's really cold out here, so that's not the most energy efficient. These are really new unit heaters. See these heaters, th these boxes right here? These um, unit ventilators. These are really new ones. If you listen, that's pretty good for, for a unit ventilator. Usually they're really noisy. But if you're in a classroom with the older ones, they are just, they're noisy. They bring air right from the outside, so it's just cold, untempered air. Um, the noise is horrible because you, if you're in a classroom and you're trying to talk to a child and they can't hear you in the back, you only hear like every third syllable. It's really hard to learn when you can't hear what's going on. Uh, but also, if you go down to the basement here, the, the air is stifling. Um, so what you would like to have is a modern uh, HVAC system 
that brings fresh air in, that tempers it in, a, in an energy efficient way, and distributes it throughout rooms and different places so that kids don't get sick. Because if you just have air blowing in it, it's not being returned anywhere, all the germs stay there. You know what I mean? It's not good. And it's, it's the kind of thing that even if you were to do a renovation, that, that's something you would do everywhere in this building. And then um, for sustainability, sustainability is, is um, more than just uh, energy. It's also how long things last. <coughs> Joe, right, Joe? Like, yeah, you know, do, do you have a, a material, a floor material that can, that is made out of things that can be recycled and or can last a really long time? Can you, so you have these hallways why isn't there daylight into those hallways that, that can go into the classrooms really deep? Because then you wouldn't have to turn on those lights all day. It's the kind of investments, and it would feel better and more open. I keep, I keep pointing to that little bit sh slot of light up there. I'm con I contend that that's making this room feel a lot more pleasant. Also the light, the height and the light bouncing off the ceiling and the way this is handled. But those are just really nice ways to handle a space. And uh, not all of these these fixtures and things are efficient. Building codes which have changed, things like handrails that that somebody could fall through. They're they're supposed to be you know very tight. Uh, things like um, just door hardware or the bathrooms that aren't um, handicap accessible. Maintenance. I might ask you to say something. In general, um, I, we asked for a list of maintenance issues. And remember that, that little that thing that, um, that Bob read about how careful the facilities committee and everybody was to try to, you know, to bring this up. Um, you have a long, long, long list. Most of the approach has been to keep water out of the building, right? To seal up holes, to put on roofs and things like that throughout the years. But even if you were to re and, and replace some windows, although maybe the middle school windows might need to be replaced again, even if you were to get through most of the, many of the maintenance issues, we may never get to air quality, energy efficiency, security, fire and structural codes, ADA compliance, like, you know, you can change some lights to LEDs, you can change a few fixtures, the water bottle things are great. You know, you can do little things like that. But in order to do it throughout and really well, I think you're at a deficit. And I think that that would be a really difficult thing to do. So it's a challenge. Do you, what, what is your feeling about, um, about what I've been talking about here and what your findings are, Joe, well, as an in-house person? It's true. It's a 60-year-old building, and it's probably reaching the end of its lifespan. Um, guys here have done a great job keeping it up and running. And uh, every day the lights come on. and it's warm and things are moving forward, um, but yeah, it's it's a dated building. Okay, chip in anytime you want. If you if I say something that doesn't make any sense, um, there's a real community tradition here of like this is because this is a, such an important community building of chipping in, and uh, I know that the fields and the lighting were part of part of donations, and I know that. Like students with their projects have a, a very intricate composting system here that really works and uh, they really most of you I don't know if most of you have kids but they know a lot more about the earth and, and being green than, than we do you know they just kind of grow up with it a little more um, integrated and then the greenhouses and the whole uh, horticulture program is very very here and uh, it would be great to continue with those things that are so much about who you are as a community and what your history is there's no real way to sum all this up you can read the facilities report it's like really thick so what we tried to do at the end of each section is, is summarize it but here I think this sentence, the existing facility has passed its useful life in most every aspect. 
Um, certainly the systems and the electrical, uh, all those kinds of systems are, and most of the materials and things like that are as well. Um, the exterior construction was not efficiently or, or very well built. When I say well built, it's not the Parthenon or something. It's not it's supposed to last over 2,000 years. But uh, it was built at a time when energy efficiency was not the primary motive for building. Therefore, the wall cavities and all of that just wasn't built the way it can be built now. We'll talk about utilities and, and energy later. Um, lots of um, examples of, uh, of places where air and water can come in and all of that. So I think that's the, uh, the simplest thing is that it's an old building and it's going to, you know, over time, it just keeps catching up to you and you're always trying to maintain something rather than have, being able to take a breath and, and let it be. After doing that, we got to take a little break and change the subject for a while and really look at case studies of different schools and vision about what makes um, your school different. We went to place, uh, who went to West Coast? Scarin, you went. And there are certain places that were visited that were very much about technology, you know, training kids to make things, to, um, it's almost like you're in a Google sort of atmosphere. I've only seen it in the movies, where they sit in those cool chairs and all of that. But it's really about collaboration, it's much more open, much more about the work. If you do something, you make a project, there it is. And you can see what's going on and ask questions and learn. It's not always just about how it looks, it's about what it does. This is an example of West Bridgewater Middle High School of a, of a new school that's in Massachusetts. And what's interesting about it is that it has areas, kind of clusters of areas. Since it has middle school, they work in teams. Um, do you, any of you have kids in the middle school? There we go. You know that they have their, their four main team. And it's all like a, a real effort has always been made in middle school to create collaboration, do group work, and to have a smaller little community because middle school is a really difficult time to socially, emotionally, uh, physical change. Everything's changing, and it's really good to have just a few teachers who know all, all about you. And that's how that's set up. But I wanted to point out a couple things, like these kind of breakout areas in the hallways where you might be in a classroom group work and go out and work, you know, and come back, and you, there might be some visual, but you're on your own a little bit. And then that is the example of a learning commons. Instead of having a cafeteria that is in the basement and is used for two hours a day, and then the rest of the time maybe it's shut off, we are now putting, like a, think of it as a dining, or think of it as a dining room, slash reading room, slash event space, whatever it is. So the kids eat there. The learning commons or the library is right off of it. They can do presentations. They can. Therefore, it's being used simultaneous in very many different ways during out, throughout the day on weekends. Imagine if that's in the center and you have an event, a science fair, or you have a speaker coming in, or a writer, or something like that. Very, very much the center of the school. That's like the town commons, the green, where the event, where the, what was the maple sugar fair down at the, the, at the green? What was it called? Maple Madness. Maple Madness. Yeah, I saw that. I stopped by. <coughs> Liquid gold. Anyway, um, so I'm just I'm showing you this to get a sense of the kinds of spaces that are actually very flexible uh, and save space in the long run. Oops. And then this was a, a project that I had worked on in Massachusetts, but its primary focus was about. Um, innovation spaces. So you have now your, your, you have your innovation lab, which is kind of the start or seed of something that can grow throughout the whole school and change the way you all think and work together. Um, and again, an innovation or maker space or places that talk about collaboration, it's not just about technology, it's about 
the idea of prototyping, making something, coming up with an idea, trying it, failing, it falls down, like we do in our garage when we're trying to fix something. Then we go back and we learn a little more and we go back. It's that back and forth you just did a innovation lab. It's really about the process of learning and how you can become resilient and how you can change how you, you know, and how you take that into the world and you can do any job. So we had these visit um, visioning workshops and a lot of the people here are people you know. And there are a lot of um, faculty and, and educators, but there are also a number of people from the community, a couple students, I think. And this was a two-day thing, so these are a lot of people giving up their time. And what's great about having the faculty there is that they're talking about what are the, in their professional opinion, what are the pieces that they would like to have to do the things that they want to do. They're experts in education. What are the kind of spaces they need? What are the, what are the kinds of um, core masteries that are important to them? Every single place that I've gone to and watched or participated in kind of visioning or educational workshops, if you really let it be, you come up with a completely different, very different lists of what's important to this community or you know what's important to them. Here, and I, I always say this, it's the only place I've ever been where stewardship, the, I, just the concept of stewardship, and I keep asking what does that mean, but it means about you know valuing the things that you have, taking care of them, it's a lot to do with sustainability. You have the land, the park, you know, the, the land, and they're, they're in stewardship mode. You know, people have uh, foundations and they take care of them. There's a lot about environmental stewardship community. How do you bring your whole community together and, and take care of everyone? And then just about empathy and wellness. This is, this is the most thoughtful and least self-serving um, list I've seen in a long time. But I guess that's who you are. That was a compliment. <laughs> um, and then community connected was second, which means that even though this is a school, and you'd think that the faculty or the teachers would be like, where's my room? Where's my board? I need technology. Where's this thing? They're really thinking, how can everybody, and they're saying, how can everybody use this building on weekends after school? How can the kids come back? How can everybody, this become a real part of the community? Again, another testament to the kind of people that you have here. Things like authentic project-based learning, it's a mouthful. There are different ways to learn, but one of them is through projects and working together to learn how to, most people here you work, some of you work alone in a little room with a computer and never talk to anybody. I don't. Everything's about groups, right? And you have to learn to get along with people, well, as much as you can, and you gotta learn how to let different people take different pieces of something and come together and make something, or create something, or think about something. And that's what um, that means. And then just the idea of visible learning is, again, if I walk by a classroom and I'm a sixth grader, and I look in and I see eighth graders who are like monsters, right? They're this tall, my older brother or something, and they're doing something. The truth is, you want to do that. And that's how you get to the next level and you learn from that. Um, then, design patterns really just mean what kind of spaces are important. And I just wanted to point out, this was a sketch by faculty. It's a bunch of classrooms on a team around a team center <coughs> space with a mud room going in because kids have boots and, and um, then some little breakout areas where they could do different things. This was a sketch. This told, and then you see that first one says classroom neighborhoods. The idea of neighborhoods is really important for middle school, but also for high school in terms of departments like science or math or other places. So in the end, we ended up designing a building that was all about creating neighborhoods. They're not round like this, because we do have a, some kind of budget, right? But um, the truth is that that's really, really important here is to create little smaller places where the, where the faculty and the students feel like they have a home. Plus, everything they need to do is there, except when they go to art or they go to the learning commons or you know things like that. They have a home. 
Uh, so some of the conclusions here were, you know, the, the principles of stewardship and community emerged as local values. But the idea of project-based physical learning and the real idea of adaptable, flexible environments is crucial these days. I'm not advocating the idea of no walls. Do you know what I mean? Uh, that was in the 60s when they had the open classroom, because <coughs> acoustically that's pretty horrible too. It's somewhere in between, and I think it has to do with variety and accessibility to different kinds of aspects of things, different sizes and different approaches. And then, and only then, did we go to all of the faculty and staff and talk to them about their spaces. first thing we do when we met, so we come in for a couple of days and we sit, I sit in one place, right? And then they all come to us, so that's much, that's very nice if you come to us. And you might have like the, the sixth grade team, or you might have all the special education teachers, or you might have the athletics department, things like that. And we ask them first, what are the things that don't work for you? It might sound negative, but you learn a lot from what doesn't work, what drives you crazy. And you really get a sense of, you know, the, the, the existing building has to say poor, it's not very welcoming, even when you come on site, and has poor wayfinding. So that's a real problem for people visiting and not being able to find the auditorium if they have to come all the way around. It took me a while to remember to go up the stairs and to get to the library, you know. And that's easily solved with the right kind of design. Um, lack of display space. Unfortunately, a lot of the classrooms that are very much rigid in how size they are are really undersized for the number of students or for the idea of flexibility. Imagine if you have a classroom and if you just line them up like this, they all fit. Because that's how we used to learn, right? You can put 24 kids in there or 20 or whatever it is. But the second, these days, you actually you want to take these, put these kids over here, break them into groups, create different areas. It's kind of like when you go to a kindergarten classroom and they have the sand table and the water table. It's just that that's how it works better now to teach. When you have a room that's too small, you can't do it. You literally can't set up your room the way you want to do it. You can't even set it in a circle like this and have everybody discuss. Really important stuff. And so then when we, in a way, look at the opposite, we go, what's the right proposed program? right size classrooms with teams around a central commons or studio, lots of breakout rooms, you know, little places where you can go and, and have meetings. Sometimes it's good for the teacher too, if a parent comes in, they can meet there. A special education, um, special education wants to be inclusive now as much as possible, which means that if a kid has any kind of, um, any kind of um, learning issue, if the special educator can come to them, work with them in the classroom, they need room to do that. Or pull them, somebody pulls somebody off and sit in a smaller room where it's quieter and they can take a test or whatever it is. It's a very different environment than, than what is set up now. Uh, very important, the idea to all of the faculty of a learning commons that has all of the kind of public, for the kids, the social spaces right in the middle of the school. and. You have a wonderful horticultural program, but the lab and, and the science programs, but the labs are very obsolete. Um, and just the idea of music and drama and visual arts rooms that are bigger and, and you know work better ventilated and can work better. And uh, one of your gyms, the high school gym, is beautiful, right? It's big, it has plenty of space, and the middle school gym is way small and you really can't even play basketball in there. So um, uh, if, you, if you have a middle and high school, you probably need two courts. So we started talking about having you know, two legitimate courts. This is the kind of detail that you end up getting into. I don't recommend you stare at it too long because you'll start to it'll vibrate your eyes. Um, the idea here is that we actually went through each of these lines is an area, STEM, math, um, learning commons, seventh grade team. Behind all of those, we have spreadsheets of every single space in the whole building and how big <coughs> it is. And we have plans that match it. So we look at the existing. 
very important to understand your existing first. Because we were also doing renovation schemes, and we need to know what we can reuse. And then after going through it, we come up with what we felt were the ideal spaces, and it came up to about 160 something thousand square feet. Um, and we think, now we've sat down with Garen and gone over this. We came up with a square footage. Um, it's conservative, meaning it's probably a little larger than it needs to be, even though we did some paring down. If in the future we decide that we go forward, we can find more space. We can really um, make it even tighter. Square footage does equal money, you know, in general. Uh, that's why they call it cost per square foot. So the, the, the more um, efficient you can make a building, the better off you'll be in the end. But right now we're doing a master plan and we're just not gonna pound it with a hammer because you might go too far. So keep in mind that it, we can always find more space. One of the things we realized was you have an existing school, it's a certain size, and there's a certain number of kids here. Our program was about 30,000 30, something square feet more than that. Well, why is it bigger? Even if you're just right, some of it's like right-sizing classrooms and adding things. For the most part, the new types of spaces that were added into the program were community-based learning kind of spaces. So when you walk in, there's community spaces and places for people to come and join with the community. And there's more innovation lab, um, more art studio and, and kind of maker areas because um, that's where the learning is going. And then there were a, quite a bit more like team breakout, central commons. For every team, there was kind of a central common space for them to collaborate. And faculty planning areas, all the kind of places that kind of a modern school would have. So really, between the community, the innovation, and the and the, the collaboration spaces, that's where this that's where the, the square footage grew conceptually. Does that make sense? You can ask, well, why is it bigger than the school you have now? This is where it gets fun. These were sketches that we drew when we were talking to teachers. This was another sketch of one of those teams where you have a gathering, you have science and English and, and breakout spaces and things around a center space. But look at this, this is the diagram for the whole school, which has the commons and all the shared libraries and innovation spaces. And these are the seven, eight, nine, it says 10, 11, 12, those are the grades wrapping around it. I'm going to make a metaphor. I'm not sure if it's a metaphor or an analogy. Here's your towns. How many towns do you have right now in the union? Depending on how you count them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to be an easy answer. Right? But just think of it as, as it becomes apparent when you look at this kind of thing that diagrammatically, community is about taking different neighborhoods, different places, and joining them together around a shared place. And if we can think of this school as the shared place, then you all live in the same place, and you all have the same community. Uh, this is a diagram that literally shows parking, how to come in, there's a lobby, there's security. The gym and the auditorium would be the things that everybody uses in the weekends and nights, so that could be closed off. And then you walk in and there's like a learning commons in the middle. Everybody's working around it, all the different functions. But even out from there, you have your <coughs> terraces and your gardens, which you're going to have. You're, and, you're going to ha and you have your fields, and you have the river, and you have your view in the mountain. All of this is part of the environment that you have. And you're very lucky, not lucky, but you just have it. You have a wonderful site. And I was just out there watching the first baseball I've seen. <coughs> and it's surrounded by mountains. It's pretty cool. Um, this is a sentence that after we did um, programming, we saw all those list of deficiencies and all that. I wanted to create a sentence that went all the way back to the goals. Like, what are we trying to solve? And I'm, I'm going to read it. This is, this is all you have to do. 
<laughs> an open, day lit, flexible, and collaborative learning environment. Welcome to the whole community with proper adjacency, student display, healthy energy efficient systems, healthy is important, uh, integrated technology, high performance construction, and connected to our natural resources. So it's very simple, just do that. I mean, that's, and that's what you want. I'm, not, I'm telling you what you want, you know. Um, and then only after we did that did we do some options. And the important thing here was to look at renovation, to look at renovation addition, and to look at new on the site and what the ramifications of those things are. So in the first round, we, no, so this is your site. We're looking down on a building. The blue areas, I hope everyone can see blue, okay? The blue areas represent existing. So there's the middle school, there's the high school, and, and the gym. And the orange represents additions or new. So that very first one, A, was the idea of keeping as much of the existing building as possible and just adding on some of the new spaces that really helped it start to work. So it's mostly, you know, existing. Um, the next one was you tear down, you probably just keep the, in B, you just keep kind of the high school because that's the easiest thing to work with and I'll explain it again. Uh, and then all the orange is trying to make all the kinds of spaces work. The hardest spaces to make work in this existing building are those neighborhoods or the idea of these classrooms, which really are probably the most important thing in a school is where the kids actually sit and learn and, and teach and, and all of that. Really hard to do in a corridor school, especially if you're not allowed to touch the walls, <laughs> right? So, uh, and then we did a couple of schemes where if the existing building, so it shifts, there's a union arena. If the existing building is kind of over here, the idea is to build a new building somehow in conjunction with the union on the football field area. And then when that's done, phasing easy, you know, then you tear down the old and you put in a field or something like that. That's like, if you're building a new building, that's the simplest kind of phasing and the least expensive. So we looked at those kinds of options. We did a little piece on each one showing all the different um, program elements. You can see how we're trying to make teams here, but the teams are around quarters and it's really tough to make them work. Um, and then we even start to look at it in three dimensions, at least three dimensions, um, in the computer and start to understand how it all lays out. There are always problems with a lot of these. For example, in this one, that track that is shown. One of the big program elements that's not in the school is the idea of can we create a turf, artificial turf field for football and other sports, those who play sports know, and have a real running track around it. It's a high school, you have a, a really good running, you know, uh, um, track team, you don't have a track. Now it's big and it, it should be able to fit, but in certain um, in certain designs, it fits better on the site than others. It's just because the buildings over here are not over here. In this one, unfortunately, it's down really low in this area here where it's really tight up against the river and all of that. And it may not really, it doesn't really work very well. So those are the kind of things. And also, if you keep the existing building, you can see here, we keep the, we keep the road coming in we try to create a better turnaround to separate buses and cars for safety. We really can't impact very far with parking. So if you need, would you do more parking and safer drop off and all that? There's, with the existing area here, there's not much room to do it. Just a factor of where the school is and where it's placed. Um, we tried, even in schemes like this, we try to create new entry and new areas off to the river. So we did this and other, we, we looked at other ideas. This one adds on a lot. In a way, if you just keep the high school and then add on all of that, you start to wonder to yourself, well, why aren't I just tear, tearing down the whole thing? And I think the finances um, back that up. And then we looked at the idea of 
of new schools that kind of faced the sun and the river and the views. Imagine that. So that all of these houses, think of these as the houses right here with their places in there. Each one of the classrooms has a view out to the river and the sun is coming in and they all gather together in their little places. But then when they come out, they gather into larger areas, uh, just like that diagram except squared off a little bit. And here's another example of a way to look at it. The, the main thing about this basic design right here is that with the sweep, is that again, it follows the river and the views, but it, oh, it you can see in the back, it opens up to the entrance, which is really interesting, the idea of, you know how now you drive in and you're like, okay, I'm at a school, but where am I? Where do I go? That sense of welcome or that sense of wayfinding even, the idea here is that you come in and there's the, there's the entrance. I know where to go and I feel like I'm, I'm part of this. We looked at, um, remember those goals in the beginning? Well, these are criteria. Site organization, <coughs> project cost, community connected, sustainability, learning environments. How would you judge these different things? You could judge it on how much it costs, but there's probably for every single one of these things, there's tons of different I, things that, that, that are part of that decision. For example, cost is not just cost of construction, but it's length of construction and number of phases. If I do an existing building and do lots of little renovations, it might take years of disruption and moving kids and all of that to move it around. And I have a trailer and the guy has to stay, you know, a lot longer for general conditions it's called. And, and it might cost a lot more just for the actual uh, phasing of it and the disruption for, for programs is very important. So there's a lot of different reasons why one thing would get more points or be more advantageous than another. So just sweeping through it, it comes as almost no surprise that when the more of the existing building that you keep, the less of those categories you check off and the, the lower scores. That's because it's not just about how easy it is to go in there and, to, and paint it. It's about this disruption. How well did it organize on the site? Did it leave me more room for parking? Can I put in better fields? Um, how, how connected to the community is it? How sustainable is it? When I have an existing building and I can't do anything about the exterior walls and the insulation and all of that, well, guess what? my utility costs are going to be a lot less if I build a new building to the new standards, which are very different than they used to be. Nowadays, when we build a building, it's almost like a refrigerator box, where you build a structure and you put this like insulation over the whole thing, around the whole box, even with the windows. And it's a completely different way of building than it used to be. So I would say that, well, that's why sustainability gets a low score there. And then as you go further up and you're able to get more light in and have better views and have a better envelope and all those, the scores go up. It's kind of as simple as that. Um, well, some of the conclusions after looking at these first ones, we very rarely do some options and then everybody goes, that's the one. It doesn't work that way. We do varying options and people say, I like this from this one, this from this one, put it together. That's exactly what happened here. I think that people um, decided on it. They, they liked this particular new scheme, D, which opened up, and we, I think we call it the river option or something like that. But between these two, we wanted something in between. Something that didn't leave the whole entire existing building, but took down the middle school two-story wing, which was the most problematic to change uh, to put in systems, again, with those concrete wall, how do I put in ductwork and pipes and all of that? And because of those seismic codes that we couldn't solve or would cost a lot of money. So we combined those two and came up with a renovation option that was a little bit different. Uh, so then we moved into the next phase. So now we only have two options at this point. So you see that hopefully this looks like it's a practical approach. Um, in this option, 
we keep the auditorium and this wing here, but we took out the middle school and we kept all of the area here, which is the high school. High school is easier to renovate because it's made out of steel frame and you can just take out walls and keep the steel frame and reuse it adaptively. And we were able to put all of the kids and their classroom neighborhoods out here. We even put it in the location of the amphitheater that's out there because the amphitheater is cool and everybody likes it. Um, the orientation is improved. Uh, it's possible to put in a track and field over here, but as you can see with the berm, there would be a lot of site work in order to make that work well. We get a little more space over here for parking and for <coughs> access, um, and it's an, it's an improvement. So we looked at that. We looked at the floor plans, and from those programs, we fit every single space in here in this configuration. When you have an existing building that you're trying to reuse so dramatically different, what happens is it's not the most efficient because you can't get the things you want next to each other very well, and you end up with a lot more circulation because you're trying to connect things that have never been connected. Um, having dead-end corridors and things, we try to create an entrance and loop things together. So inherently, a renovation and addition will probably be a larger square footage building than if you could do it new and really control exactly where everything goes. Again, it, that just makes sense. And we looked at all the different floor plans and tried to reuse different spaces. When I had the gym I, uh, on the upper floor where I had that big middle school gym over here, I actually put the band room and some music spaces in there because I needed taller ceilings and reuse it. So there were a lot of clever ways to try to reuse it. And you can see here that there was a, a very big effort to try to connect, make a new entrance that was a single entrance for everybody instead of all over the place and to make it all make sense. And other views. This is not how the building would look. Do you know what I mean? We're starting to do sketches for just for maybe fundraising or something where you can have you know metal roofs and, and barn-like qualities to the pieces. You can imagine this could be very much like a barn-like pieces. It can fit your place, but these are just um, boxes right now. If that's something you were worried about. Um, and then this was what we call a river school. It has excellent orientation for all of the classrooms. When we put something on the north side, it's often the gym or the or the um, or the uh, auditorium that really doesn't want a ton of windows. Um, there's a lot more room coming in, and one of the things I actually like about this scheme is you come in, same place. There's a lot more space for queuing and dropping off of cars, so that cars can just get stuck out here when they're dropping off. There's a really wonderful separation between cars, but also, and you'll see it a little later, <coughs> this football and the track is up high, and it's close to the entrance. So I feel like it's really part of the, the community. Because you can imagine coming here for like lacrosse on the weekends or something, there it is. It's not hidden down here or anything. I just thought that was a nice aspect. The floor plan, believe it or not, is really just like the, uh, the diagram. You come in through administration, very um, protected. There's a lobby, that purple is the lobby, and you can go into the gym or the auditorium without going into the rest of the school. Or you can go into this area here, which is the commons. That's color to color, but it's very open. So that's the dining commons in the middle. So you could go in there and you could use that whole space and you could close off the wings. Uh, again, safety and the ability to um, save on heat and, and use the, the whole building for the, for the uh, community. Um, okay. It's a two-story building, which is <coughs> fairly practical. Everything stacks pretty well. I know there have been some questions whether, by, as you go through your um, re, with, tell me what that is called. The consolidation committee? The idea of the consolidation and maybe bringing um, uh, another grade up, sixth grade or something. Uh, that 
if you brought in, in something like the sixth grade, it would really just fit right into one of these modules, and maybe there'd be a little bit of an expansion for language or something like that. But it would become one of those part of one of those houses, and it would probably fit just fine. Sixth grade would still be a team structure. Oh, by the way, here on the second floor, you see that the library is kind of over the entrance. And looking out over the, um, the mountain is the innovation space. And it's all part of that, with balconies looking over, all part of that central commons. So everything kind of feeds into that one area. So it's not that you have like a, just an innovation room anymore. The idea is that you have an innovation commons and a space. Innovation's a tired word. It's a place where people can do a lot of different things um, and collaborate and do interdisciplinary work. One thing that's very important to the faculty and probably to the students because things are more complicated than they used to be, really nice if a history teacher and a science teacher can come together in an in interdisciplinary way, create a class or create a project and do it somewhere. Do you know what I mean? How do they do that? Where do they meet to, to find the technology? Who helps them with that? Can they use the innovation lab sometime? Can they go out to a room and get two classes together in a larger space? You know what I'm saying. Things like that. Um, this is one of those views where you can see that if you were to, you can imagine that if you were to drop in and we didn't populate the whole world with trees, it's a computer. Um, this entrance is very, very apparent and welcoming. And it's set back on the site. So one of the other things that that does when you set it back on the site is it makes it smaller. Do you know what I mean? It, like, it changes the scale of it. It's, it turns out that when things get farther away, they look smaller. <laughs> um, but the other thing it does is here's this building, and it creates a space, and it works with the arena and it works with the, um, the, the administration building and it kind of works together as a little campus. And that's a nice thing about that placement. That's what it looks like from the riverside. And again, imagine these could be like little like barns. Somebody said, can't we just do, we don't need a build, we could just do it in a barn, like what we do. I and I would say, yes, but maybe more like eight or 10 barns put together. And if you want to do that, take eight, 10 barns and put them together, you'd have a wonderful school. But that's the intent of this. If you look at these buildings, they could all be like those pieces put together. There's no reason why they couldn't look like that. So when we first evaluated these, there's a number of ways to evaluate this. It's easy to say, I like the new school, it looks great. But the truth is that, um, there wants to be other criteria involved, and one of them has to do with all this talk about energy, uh, utility costs. These are three um, tabulations. The first one says, if I took the existing building um, right now at 139,000 square feet, how much does it <coughs> cost per year? And I think in 2017, we were given a number, $217,000 for a year that you pay for utilities. Um, by square footage, the reason I circled those, that's the best comparison, at $1.6 a square foot. That's a pretty normal um, cost per square foot for an older building. Because it can, you know, sometimes it's up near two, which is not very efficient. Um, what was interesting about the option one where we did the existing with the additions, remember that one? We kept the existing building and we did additions on it, but because of its inefficiency, it was quite a bit over the 162 or 4,000 square feet. So it was more like 190, at least in that, in that design. And because we talked to our engineers, and because so much of the building was still the old building, and, um, it was leaking energy like crazy, and he, never, he didn't think we could get we could improve the cost per square foot very much at all. On top of that, because it's a bigger building and not as efficient, it actually cost more to heat, even though it was a little cheaper, it cost more to heat than the old building because it was bigger. A little bit of a, a 
I would have known that if we hadn't gone through the process. With the new school, if, if it's right on target, which are designed in terms of square footage, just building a modern, efficient, efficient building, and I'm not talking about necessarily triple glaze windows and any other, you know, other crazy stuff, but just really an efficiently well built building. The cost per square foot, according to mechanical engineer, went down substantially, close to one dollar. See what I mean? <laughs> and um, if it, we have done some schools uh, recently. Now our our firm does um, projects very similar to this, and we've done projects in Maine and in New Hampshire. Um, Maine has a funding source at the state level, but New Hampshire does not. So when we do projects in, they have no state funding there. And we do a lot of um, very energy efficient buildings. Uh, we try, we're trying at, at one middle school I'm working on right now in New Hampshire to do what's called net zero ready. And what that means is that we create the most efficient building we can in terms of its um, systems and its envelope and then in this particular one we're doing some geothermal wells but that's another story um, and then if you put in a lot of solar if you make it mostly an electrical fed building and you use a lot of solar um, panels for creating electricity you can get to a you, the idea is to get to a place where you can um, in the sell to the grid and buy back to the grid and basically um, have an even energy, like use no and use, spend no money for energy over the course of the building, of the year, you know. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because we say net zero ready because sometimes you can get with a power purchase agreement or something with the uh, PVs, you can get a whole bunch of um, photovoltaics on the ceiling, on the roof, but then later on maybe the town builds another, um, uh, field, I think I, I drove by one coming in. We had field, was that a town, farm, um, farm uh, a solar okay. farm, and those can if you built one or two of those just for the schools or for public buildings, you could supplement and actually get there. Uh, it's just a nice way of looking at it. People talk about lead and getting different certifications, but if you just focus on energy, you can get a long way. One of the reasons I really do like the daylighting corridors or in main spaces or is that it really does allow you to turn off the lights or to dim the lights with LEDs uh, through much of the year and you save a ton on electrical when you can do that because uh, lighting loads are one of the biggest users of electricity not just heat so what does this tell us it tells you that that the way that they build buildings today and the way we can build buildings and aren't doing that, it can be a lot less money per square foot to heat and to cool. We had about 25% air conditioning in that design. Then we looked at the idea of what would it cost to build different scenarios. Now, we went to a cost estimator. Cost estimators are different than contractors in terms of how they would estimate a professional cost estimator looks at it they know they know what they're doing they look at all the business and the, and the economy but they don't want to come in low because then you start a project and later on you say how come you gave me that number if I went to a contractor or a construction manager they might come up with a low number because they want to get the job in the future so we know this the numbers that we have here from a, from a um, cost estimator are, I would consider these to be conservative numbers, which means that they're, they're middle to high. And that's important to know because whenever you do any kind of project and we're just in the beginning stages, we personally feel that it's better to tell you what it could be then make some crazy promise and then you get started and you find out you're in trouble. You never want to get in that place. So that's where these numbers come from. Just want to point out a couple of things. We looked at the idea of taking the existing building, just the existing building, 
and renovating it, kind of heavy renovation throughout. And I realized that we can't solve very all the problems. But also all we did was take that square footage. And this means we repaired a lot of the exterior. We redid as much of the interior and the materials as possible. New ceilings, new floors, and we put in all new systems in this in this test, right? All new systems, all new HVAC in this existing building, all new piping, all new plumbing, everything. And the cost for the total project was still up in the 40s, 40 million. And why is that, at least in this design? Heavy renovation costs a certain amount of money. We're still puncturing holes and tearing things down and trying to fix things. Um, <coughs> It is not as big as the square footage that you want, so you don't get that. The construction came out to a certain cost. It says 26 million. I'm just giving it as an example. Site, site upgrades, we kind of handled the same throughout everything, fields and all of that. But then when you get to where it says 30% and 28%, 30% means general contractor and, and contingency. When you're working on an existing building, the money that you have in the pool for contingency meaning for problems is a lot is more say you know another three percent four four percent more because every time you punch open a wall there could be a pipe something you don't know about because you just I don't think there's very good drawings on this building and there's a lot more that you will find uh, and there's a lot more that go goes in and then the other part of that is that if you're doing an existing building, you got to move the kids, either have temporary trailers, <coughs> classrooms, or you're moving the kids all over the place for the summer, you know, it can all just be quick little summer jobs. And that takes a lot longer, which means that you, the contractor stretches out their work and they have to pay the foreman and their superintendent costs a lot more. Therefore, those percentages are higher. And lastly, there's something that people never talk about. When you look in an article that says, oh, blah, blah, blah is building a school and it costs this much, they almost never give you the real project cost in the newspaper. They talk about the construction cost. How much does this cost? It costs 26 million. You know, like that's what they tell you. But when you add up all the other stuff that's real, soft costs are the idea that you have architects engineering fees, permitting fees, furnishings, equipment, Furniture could cost two and a half, three million dollars for a big school like you know what I mean? These are wonderful table tables and chairs, but then you have to buy them for everybody. Um, you can reuse some things, I'm sure. But all of those things add up to what are called the soft costs and the owner's costs on the side for testing and all that kind of stuff. When you put it all together, that's where you get the real cost. So we always show you the real cost because we're not here to do a little dance and tell you something else. Um, what, what does that mean? It means that if you just did an existing building and you tried to bring it up to the kind of, the kind of level that you felt was, was really a value for the next 30, 40, 50 years, it would cost that much anyway. Uh, somebody can come in and say it'll cost less, but they'll do less. So that's all. Um, option one was interesting because that's the one where we did the existing building and the additions. <coughs> There's a couple of, the price is kind of in between what it costs to do a renovation and what it costs to do new per square foot, but the combined school is bigger. And that's probably the biggest reason why this comes in so high is because it's bigger, it's more complicated, it still has that phasing and that disruption and that stretched out. It might, if this takes two years to build, this would probably take four. It's just something to get in your head, that it takes that much longer and, and uh, there's a lot of costs associated with length of construction and complexity. So we went through the same thing here. <coughs> that one, and then we, we looked at the new school, and again, we have control over this. We have an existing building that's used throughout the entire construction process, just as it is now. Yes, you have to put up site walls and, and staging areas and all of that, but we can build this building, and you lose your football field for a couple of years, which isn't fun. But then you can tell everybody you're going to get an artificial turf field, which is going to be um, 
wonderful because you you can use it over and over and over. It doesn't get soggy. It doesn't get all torn up. You just keep using it. I think whoever's in the athletics would like that. Um, and it was inter it's interesting because there's a certain cost of construction, <coughs> and then the site upgrades are the same, but the the con contingencies and the contractor cost <coughs> is, it's a cleaner, faster build. So the percentage is much less. And the contingency is less because we get to do all the drawings, and there it is. We don't have to worry about what's in a wall. And the soft costs are less as well because of contingencies and things like that. So this is a certain amount of money, 58 on the low side, let's say. If we can go in there and we can work with Garrett and everybody, we or we talk about um, demographics, and we decide that we, we're really planning for a certain number of kids and we can make it smaller, um, and we do some value engineering, we get to a certain price. Another thing that can happen in the future is if you decide to look at financing, we can um, work with a, 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 a construction manager, a firm, because we do that all the time. It's actually a better process is if we work together <coughs> with somebody. We don't hire each other, you hire both of us. But the good thing about that is that we work together to find the best value and the best price. And that person is going to build the building, but they're testing all the pricing all the way through. So instead of going out to bid and finding out, I'm just telling you a very interesting thing. Instead of going at the end and putting it out there and seeing what you get, this person is constantly um, creating a price. And we work with them to change details, to change things around, and make it that value. And actually, that's how I think most buildings in New Hampshire, Vermont, and uh, Maine are now being built in that way. Much more collaborative. I like it. I like working with people who know what they're doing more than me. Um, so that is a value proposition. There's a, there's, a, there's a cost here, and then I think someone like Jason will probably respond to that. <coughs> This is almost a no-brainer. The idea that hey, it's a, it's a, you get much better scores for every category when you build new and you can control everything. I am almost afraid to put it up there. It's so simple. And then, um, lastly, if you really think about all of you know mechanical systems, what the interior spaces and materials are, um, what the energy you know, and the disruption and, and all those different factors. Um, when we talk to the different committees, <laughs> and the last group that we talked to, uh, Bob? Yes, the configuration committee. The configuration committee, I think, came to the same realization uh, that it costs money. But if you're going to do anything, I think that they felt like building it new was the best bet for long-term, for sustainability, and for oper long-term operating costs for everything into the future. And in the end, I think um, the idea was that a new school optimizes the site in the river, has the right orientation and a compact footprint. Compact footprint means less, thing, less um, air to heat. Um, achieves the master plan goals is easy and less disruptive to build, offers the best long-term value, and creates an accessible, flexible, and future-ready uh, environment for learning. Kind of like that crazy sentence that tried to do everything. If your goal is to is to do is, to, is overall value and a holistic approach to longevity, energy, education, and all those different things, this is probably the best way to go. Um, and at least that's what we were told. I will, I'm going to turn it over to one of you, but I, I will say this. This is, this um, is a timeline that talks about the conceptual master plan in the very first piece. So we did that. And what I just expressed to you was that process of uncovering information, testing things, putting it together, and trying to give you the information you needed to make some kind of decision. 
whatever that decision is, the next step would be to really look at the financial feasibility of it. Because, as I understand it, it would need to be a public-private kind of um, collaboration. And that's different than, well, they usually are public-private. There's usually a tax. Even if the, the state was giving you money, there would be a tax. Here, um, you may rely more on donations and things like that. So do you want to talk about the, the next steps? So I, I think that um, this is a lot of information for everybody to digest. Uh, all of the building uh, evaluation reports are online and available to people to reread since this presentation tonight as well as I believe the full presentation is available too to reread and go back um, because we will be discussing this at our um, June 1st retreat in great length for the morning session um, and we will be taking a vote on how we want to proceed as a full board on June 10th so tonight what I'd really like to do because we're not going to get into a deep conversation this evening but since Lee is with us tonight, if anybody has any clarifying questions that they'd like to ask him to help them with the process and the conversation as we move forward, <coughs> I, I think that's the way we should move this evening. Um, anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Pamela? Thank you. If you could um, clarify how you <laughs> think about balancing um, right down. Visible learning versus security. Mm -hmm. you think about the other glass. Well, there's there's a lot of. Are you an educator? No. Yes. So there's a lot of layers to that. Um, one of the things, just from the outside of the building, is the um, the views and things into a building because you want to create angles from outside a building so that somebody can't look in easily and see who's in the classroom and things like that. Um, so that's just outside the building. When you move inside, wouldn't it be wonderful if everything was all glass and open and, and all of that? There's a couple, so what we, we, we tend to do is we focus on what are some of the things that you're really trying to say? If you walk in and your whole idea is about collaboration and or, or um, learn, uh, you know, innovation, well, maybe that is a glass wall. And that's that one place where everybody comes in. In middle school especially, high schools can be the same with departments, but middle school especially, there's a huge concern with just disruption. Every time a kid walks by and looks at <coughs> the classroom, they all go, oh, it's Billy, it's Billy. Right? They all go nuts. And uh, they just can't help it. And the teachers are very concerned about, into the classrooms, about distraction. And I'm not even talking about lockdown yet. So <coughs> for the most part, we'll try to have high windows at classrooms and, a, and lots of walls and maybe um, transoms or something or side lights at classrooms. So I'm kind of going to the very other side of it for disruption. But also, <coughs> if there is a security lockdown and you're in the classroom, you need to get to a place where you can stand and hide so people looking in don't see you. So then all they need to do, if the door is solid, all they need to do is pull a shade at the side light and that room is closed off and they can lock it. <coughs> That's that part of it. But then we'd have to discuss throughout the school what are the appropriate levels of both vision um, and um, sometimes security means I can see everything. Like if I have that center space and I have certain people like the nurse and the band, whatever, you know, looking at uh, the library, looking over that space, that means it's being monitored, which means that kids can, you know, think if something's happening, people know about it and they can watch kids. Uh, and then for every space, I think we'd have a discussion about how open it is. But that doesn't stop us from having display right when you walk in the door, um, having, having projects right there when you walk in. You don't have to like literally look into a classroom and see what they're doing to visually learn. We'll make it so they can bring the stuff up front so that when you have a community event, there it is. Does that make sense? 
because that's something most places are missing um, is that kind of portraying themselves and what they do here. That's what I like about that one picture of that, that place in California um, where they just had walls and walls of pictures and projects and stuff. You can do that kind of thing if, if, as long as the fire marshal lets us. Is that an okay answer? Thank you. Anyone else? I have a question. Oh, Please. Lord, <laughs> let everybody ask. Let's go back to the square footage part. <coughs> and where is that the chart? It's of two screens back. Or three okay. Screens back? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you wanted to give us the, the actual real cost of doing this? Right. Um, looks like I hit. One second. I'm not avoiding your question. I hope. Well, I might be avoiding your question. <laughs> there it is. Well, you might have to give me an answer before June 1st. All right. Well, all I'm going to do is this now. Yeah. Yeah. It's going on. Oh my God, it's all the way to the beginning. You can scroll on the side here. Okay. It'll be a lot faster. Sorry, guys. Okay. Turned into a computer. Left, left, left. Here you go. Down this guy? Down. Oh, okay. Grab that thing. Little box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't. The problem is, I really can't see the screen. Uh, you, you, you probably see it better than I do. Yeah. We're on it. Go. Yeah. I am clicking. <laughs> <laughs> so, this uh, is going on. You just asked a question. My question is, is that... Oh, there it is. I'm going to take this one down. This is going to work. Watch this. <laughs> Come on. Let's <laughs> say, if you want to talk, I can try to pull it up. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> First, tell me what the um, what the question is. You guys, three different... You got three different um, scenarios there. Right. And you got the, on the last and first one is with uh, existing. The second one is really with existing. How apples third, to apples, right? Is that the one you were looking at, Jim? I think so. Yeah. Good. Yeah, okay. Oh. No, 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 do not press. Okay. No, so you got constructions, 39 million, site upgrades, blah, 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 22% general mm -hmm. contract contingencies, and 25% for the soft cost. Okay, so you build a building and two years later, what's it going to cost to, to take this building down? That is actually the demolition costs were within the estimate. Okay, so it's in there. It's so just it's in the construction cost. Just so because just to let you know, so I'm gonna take this one as an example. Yeah, that's all. When the um, when the estimator the estimator is is has a has an estimate that talks about what it really costs to do a building and not just like what he sees. So he is looking at other examples of schools all around and all of that. And he had a piece in there for for the demo of the existing building. He had a piece in there for some, you know, temporary conditions. He had a piece in there for, well, what if there's some ledge or something or some soils that <coughs> don't have fill? They put in allowances for a lot of different contingencies. That's one reason why it's, I consider this to be conservative because you put in some money for most of the things that can, for example, just so you, you may know this, but over when they did the, um, when they did the, uh, the rink and they were digging up, we have the civil engineer who worked on that. It turned out that some of the soils around there were kind of junky. In other words, somebody had pushed a whole bunch of uh, bad till or something in there at some point. Yeah, when they were trying to fill in the field or something. So we said, well, we should carry some money in there for what is called structural fill uh, in case that soil is no good to bear on. And we put that on the building. I, I understand all that. Oh, yeah. I'm just trying to, if you can include by, Ju by June 1, when we're going to have this discussion, the what stuff. you have down for the cost for the deconstruction, the demolition of this building. Yeah. You just want the, the number just want for the demo? Number so that I can subtract that number from, you know, break that out, that's all. What, what's in construction? Are you a demo <coughs> contractor and you're going to do it for free? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know how you're going to build a building $238 square foot if that's including the construction of this building. That's all. Um, so right. that's all I'm looking for is the real cost. 
not and saying yes, I'm not saying no. I want to reopen. So right. break out what's in construction. Okay. So That's easy. Uh, and one of the reasons on a, you know, if you were doing a house, and you were, if, if a cost of construction would be 350 or something versus a larger building, um, you do get, when you do a large school, you get a lot of, um, a lot of economy of means. You know, actually the larger it is, probably the larger it is. Oh, I, I know, I'm just telling them that. I'm just looking for Because most people look at numbers like that and they go, well, I did this for, I did this, it was $400 a square foot. Oh, I could do a warehouse, you know, a butler building is 150, you know, things like that. Just remember, so the guy who estimated this does schools. Anybody else we'll have any questions? No one else. Does. I just, I, just to back to the um, back to this schematic. Just to say that the, the committee is the configuration and enrollment growth committee is is charged with what would be the next step in this process, and that's coming up with a financing plan. So in order to do that, both on the private side and on the public side, yeah. the, the logical place for this to go is to a point at which the board can make a decision, yay or nay, whether they endorse <coughs> an option. Then we have um, sort of the authority to be able to begin to explore uh, and evaluate what the public-private you know, funding might look like with the intent of coming back to the board, coming back with, you know, uh, back to Lee, refinement of the designs and that kind of thing. So that's the reason we want to advance this in a way that gives board approval um, you know, to, the, to the rest of the work that needs to be done. Right, and just to reiterate, the vote on June 10th is really to endorse how we, that we acknowledge that the building needs to be addressed, whether that is in renovations and add-ons or a new school. That is all we're ad uh, endorsing. No. This is ma this is making a choice. We're making a choice of a new school versus a uh, renovation. That was that was the okay, intent I'm of the sorry. the intent of the committee was to give the board a recommendation. The committee has done that, so we favor an option. Okay. And and hear from Lee, come back at the retreat, discuss, and then get to the tenth, and then have the board uh, endorse that recommendation. Or okay. not. I'm sorry. Yeah, I that's okay. On that. yep. um, but once we endorse that one way or the other on June 10th, mm -hmm. then you move forward with the financial state of feasibility in how much can we possibly raise in private funds? Is there a possibility of state funding now that that conversation has been brought up in the state house? Charlie's and then what? No, he, no, he left. He left. Yeah. He immediately left. <laughs> and um, also, what would that entail in a bond? Correct. Okay. Yes. Can I ask one question? Yes. Um, when it says no disruption on option two, let's say little disruption. Means, okay. Because <laughs> it says no disruption. There's always a couple of bulldozers around. But I assume is that because of where the new site would be that students would still be able to have school and. and Right. In this building, so that's in, in these buildings, trailer. you yeah. If, if you're if you're doing that rent of renovation schemes, you have to come up with a whole phasing system and, and moving. You might move the library twice. You know, you might move. You know, things like that. Um, and that one, yeah. If you can stay, if you can stay in your existing building and just use it. Well, that's being uh, happening on the other side and, and keep access and there's a road that actually comes up around and down around the, the rink and there's your access you know where all the trucks go so we think about those things a little bit but it seems to be the easiest way to go about it um have you been in, involved in a project that had renovate or new or renovation or one of your schools? Yeah, it, it is. <coughs> it is disruptive in this because you have to. Okay, we're going to move this section of kids over here. The learning spaces during that period where you, you're <coughs> under renovation are often not ideal for kids. Um, so there is some value in terms of not having to go through that and to just have the construction happening. 
outside of the learning environment and then when it's done, <coughs> bring the kids over. Um, I've seen it done both ways and it, it is certainly preferable for kids and teachers um, to um, not have to go through the phasing process. And it also it, it extends the length of time. So, you know, I think you, you referenced this, Lee, that instead of something taking two years in construction, you may be out for, you know, four or more years mm -hmm. uh, because it it's a much less efficient way to if do it. If it were a small project, like, a, oh, we're doing some renovations to an elementary school and you can do it over a couple summers, mm -hmm. it's not bad. Yeah, I thought that maybe <coughs> there's just like, um, in terms of that finance and seeing what those new construction costs be, there might be some things to consider in our June meeting that like <coughs> maybe parking or how sports might be affected just so that we have those things in front of us. I don't know what the phase would look like. Sometimes you have to pay to bring like trailers in to have um, additional classes and that type of thing. So that's those are things you have to weigh. I mean, there would be a cost to setting up a place for the football team to play. Okay. There's a cost to that. Is there, any, is there <coughs> consideration about placement with respect to the river? So we had a 100-year flood how many years ago, and I know it flooded some of the lower fields. Is there anything that you can do? Or is the, that, um, was that taken into consideration? Well, yeah, when we, when we spoke to the civil engineer, um, first of all, you could see that with the new building, <coughs> keeping it up on the plateau. And uh, that makes a, it, uh, as far as we know it, the, the water hasn't gotten up there, mm -hmm. but it can be soggy. Those lower fields, especially in at one corner, uh, is, can get real soggy. <coughs> I think the, um, the civil engineer recommended doing some work to the fields for drainage, to improve the drainage. I don't think he could ever solve solved it down there, but to raise some of those up and to do better drainage around it. And we put in some money for some of that. But when it says like 4.5 million, there was some some allowance in there to try to improve drainage on the lower fields, things like that. It is low and it is along that river. And when does it usually happen in the, in the spring? Mud season just ended. Like it looked like spring here now, almost. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I think that your lows, some of those fields will always have some issues, um, but can be improved. But the but the idea of creating a, a large turf field that can be used over and over and over, and not <coughs> um, and not be damaged, that creates a huge scheduling um, uh, um, boon for the athletics and for the towns. I read a little bit about improving academic achievements and health outcomes for students' mental health and um, you know, reduction in absenteeism, reducing headaches, and the stomach aches, the things that you get when you're in a building with poor air quality, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to those benefits. It's a bigger deal than we think. Um, uh, there's different kinds of air systems, but modern buildings are supposed to have fresh air where there's a certain number of air changes in a room or a classroom every hour or something like that. There are certain kinds of systems, one's called like displacement air, those of you who have it, where the, where the air comes in low and gets pulled up high and, and it, it's like 100% <coughs> changing in, of air. And we did a, I remember at my last firm, we did an elementary school and they actually somehow tracked all this and, and absenteeism and sick days went down by 30%. And, uh, and interestingly, their uh, their cost for um, utilities <coughs> went down 30%. You know, it's kind of like a win-win once you do <coughs> it. The codes are terrible in that they allow you to be able to use your windows as ventilation. Even up here in the Northeast, it's not real. Because you're, I mean, as a teacher, you probably do open your window sometime and go, this is so stuffy or whatever. But talk about energy efficiency. <coughs> The most energy efficient building is sealed these days. And you bring in air and you clean it. So it had another thing that has a huge um, effect on health are the kinds of materials that you use. So you've heard of off-gassing. Mm -hmm. So to bring in a certain, to use certain adhesives that don't put off gases and um, 
under your carpet or under your tile or, or paint or any of those kinds of things to use materials that don't put off. <coughs> Have you been in a new, pla a new place that had new carpets? And it was like, oh my God, that's actually, those are chemicals. And I'm not crazy, you know, it's just, it's not healthy. Um, another thing that I, I believe affects people's ability to, to learn and, re and stay awake is daylighting. And it's okay to be able to look out the window every now and then have a view to understand that you're part of a bigger place. I don't know if you agree with that, but they've, they've done tests on that kind of stuff. And, and you know, um, the kids, when we spoke to some of the students, they said, I don't like this room, we like this room. I go, why? And it turned out that that room had windows and had light, and this one was dark, and they said, I fall asleep all the time in there. It's because they're playing video games too late, but still. <laughs> so it's real. I believe it's real, and I'm not a, I'm not a huge activist. I just believe by, that by word, word of mouth that those are real. Well, I just I want to say thanks to Lee. If he comes one more time, we're going to give him the key to the town. <laughs> <laughs> Can it be one of those really big ones? <laughs> <laughs> you want any gold or silver? <laughs> uh, wood is fine. Uh, maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just got my gallon for the year. There you go. For the year. Here we go. For the year, is that? Thank you, Lee, for this great presentation. Thank you very much. Second minute. Oh, I thought. All right. All those in favor? Aye.